Right, I'll share my screen. Right, so welcome everyone. Um, welcome to another event with the SOIN, the Students for Research Network. So my name is Andre. I'm one of the committee members for, for SOIN. And uh, welcome to the third part of, the, of this SFP series. So in this part, we'll be speaking about um, SFP interviews. So SFP Specialized Foundation Program. Some of you may know it as the Academic Foundation Program. Uh, the UKFPO just changed the name this year to uh, SFP. So um, we're very uh, we're very pleased to have uh, Dr. Chin joining us today. Uh, Dr. Chin is uh, AFP and is doing F2 at the moment. So uh, I'll, I'll allow Dr. Chin to introduce herself. Uh, I think you're muted at the moment. Hello. So, yes, I'm doing F2 in Leicester at the moment. Um, I haven't actually started my research block. That's the block over Christmas. Um, so just sort of gearing up towards that now. Um, but yeah, no, thank you for inviting me. Thank you. So uh, instead of going through a PowerPoint, what I thought would be more, more useful is to just have a general discussion about, about uh, the interview. We're going through, we'll go through a couple of uh, questions. Um, sort of talking about general points, and then at the end we'll open up uh, to to anyone who has any questions about the interview. So the focus of this session is to so sort of give you some tips about how to how how you go about tackling an SFP interview. So hopefully by now at this point um, you have all sort of applied uh, for the SFP programs uh, and is sort of waiting or may have already heard. Uh, from from the deaneries or the unit of application that you've been invited to an interview. If yes, uh, congratulations. And if not, uh, some some deaneries do take some time to sort of reply back to you when when you're going to get an interview. So be so don't don't lose hope. Um, stay positive. So first of all, I just uh, let's just start off with something very very general. So what does the AFP interview involve? So, uh, Dr. Chin, do you want to sort of speak about your experience about the interview? Yeah, so um, I had applied for both Northwest and um, LNRI, which includes Leicester. Unfortunately, I didn't get an interview for Northwest, but I can speak about my interview from Leicester, well, LNRI. Um, so, I know that AFPs, they, interviews they can or sorry SFP interviews can now include either the clinical part the critical appraisal part or, or the sort of personal questions or the general interview questions um, at Leicester specifically we had the critical appraisal and the personal questions element of the interview um, it was I remember the personal questions part was about four questions um, and they ask you those and you give your answer and then um, they sort of move on to the next question. They were sort of separate from each other rather than it being a conversation. But, uh, so they, they worked through the questions and then the critical appraisal part gave me an abstract, had about 10 minutes to look at that in one room, move on to the next room um, where they had the two people uh, sat waiting and then they, they worked through questions, set questions with you. Um, so all in all, it was about, maybe I was there for about 40 minutes. Um, I think it's slightly different now, obviously given COVID and everything, it's all online. Um, but my questions were in person, traveled there, sort of were there for maybe half a day, sat there, did about 40 minutes worth of interview and came back. Um, yeah, so, so that was sort of the interview process for me. Um, I think other places will have a different combination of either critical appraisal, clinical questions, or the personal questions. Um, I th think probably the personal questions in terms of why you want to do AFP will be present in all of the interviews, and then it will be a different combination of the other ones. Yeah, I think so. So um, I'll talk about my experience as well. So I applied to Yorkshire and Humber and East of England. 
uh, and and, uh, and I luckily got in invited for interview for both. So again, very similar is sort of three different stations that, that we do. So one is the personal personal station where they ask about what you want to do AFP, uh, what have you done in terms of uh, of research uh, or teaching. Um, they also uh, specifically in Yorkshire and Humber because they um, do two types of AFP. They do medical education one and research uh, AFP, and uh, and they will ask you. Uh, at the start, whether you want to do med ed, medical education or whether you want to do research, and and from that they will, they will sort of change their questions as to they will ask you about things that you if you've said that you want to do a research SFP they will ask you questions about research, if uh, if they if you want said you wanted to do a med, medical education SFP they will ask you about uh, questions about uh, medical education and the teachings that you've done. And again, so uh, clinical scenario, which we'll go through uh, a little bit later, and then the critical appraisal. So uh, yeah, so again, for the East of England interview, uh, East Anglia interview, they, they give me an abstract and sort of read through about 10 minutes and then talk through a little bit about uh, various definitions of different things and then just to sort of generally talk through about the abstract and things. So, uh, so my one was a was a was a virtual interview. So both of them are virtual uh, because of COVID that year, uh, and and I suspect that will probably be the case for this year as well if nothing changes. So they will sort of send you an interview link. It will be either be on Zoom or Microsoft Teams. So it's really important that you find out which platform that they're using and have that application downloaded before the actual interview. And and so you won't be panicking, uh, sort of downloading the in, uh, the the app on that specific day, uh, just before that, yeah. Uh, so I think we sort of touched on this as well uh, in terms of the format of the interview. So uh, the the generally there will either be two or three uh, stations that you go through. One will uh, be the clinical scenario, which they'll run through with you. Um, and uh, I will talk about, a little bit more about that later. And uh, the other one, um, so some deaneries will do two, some deaneries will do only one. So some, uh, so it's the personal, and the um, and the uh, and the sort of academic interview. So 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 some the deaneries that will only do two stages will sort of combine the personal and the academic interview into one, and and it's almost. Uh, in the format of like your MMI, uh, multiple mini interview that you do for medical school, where you go from one station to another, whereas if it's a virtual, then you go from one virtual room to another virtual room. Is that is that similar to to uh, in our in your as well? Um. Yeah. So it was. Yeah. Actually, now I. I mean, um, the interviews were. The medical school a little while ago so I hadn't really thought about it like that um but I guess yeah it was it was like that in terms of stations and there was the it was almost not I mean saying it was a bit like Oski sounds a bit daunting <laughs> but it was it was like that in the sense that you sit outside the room um and then I mean this is what it was like when I was at, at the uni I was at you sit outside the room and then they call you in for when you're ready so it was there is that sort of in-between period between each station I guess where you have a bit of time to sort of um process the station that you just had and then prepare yourself for the next station so I, I guess it was similar yes to MMI um you had that sort of it's good because you have the period to okay I, I did that bit now and the next people they haven't met me so I will you know this first impressions all over again and um, next question and next topic I guess so so yeah it was similar in that way yeah yeah that, that, that's a very good point as well uh, so say like you for example didn't do think that you didn't do too well in, in one of the station don't don't get put off by it and and so you can pick up points at the different stations where they look at the interview as a whole and the interview is only part of their scoring process for, for the uh, SFP selection. They, they also look at your academic decile scores. Um, some some deaners will look at how many uh, publications or how many presentations that you've done. So 
it it is it is an important part of the application, but it's not an not the the most important part. I would say. Yeah, definitely, and I think um, so. The first part that I had was the critical appraisal part, um, which I thought was I was less confident about that part. So in some ways, it was good that I could get it out of the way. Um, and then I did that part and some of the questions I found difficult, um, but I was glad to have that period in between of, I mean, I, I don't know how long it was actually in minutes, but I was sat outside and I had some time to sort of compose myself and think, okay, you know, the next part I feel stronger about, I've practiced for this. Um, so I felt a bit more confident and it was, you know, fresh people. No one saw what my answers were for critical appraisal, so I could carry on and, and try and show off what I did have um, in, in that sort of element of the interview. Yeah, let, let's, let's talk about that a little bit more in terms of the critical appraisal station. Um, well, what, what would that involve? We talked a little bit about, uh, we'll get an abstract and then and they'll ask questions about it. What sort of questions did you get? So um, I actually have the feedback form from um, the interview that I had. It doesn't say the specific questions, but it gives sort of general topics. So it, I think my video will disconnect when I go on. But if I just have a look at the um, sort of feedback that I had, I can tell you guys what was involved. So um, for the critical appraisal part, the first part, they they scored me on, We they asked me to give a summary of the findings of the paper. So I'd, I'd had the, I'll just come back. So that I had the um, 10 minutes of you sat, you're sat down. So, you, so I turned up and then I'm waiting for my like interview slot. And then it comes, you're all in groups. And then my group got called up and then we all go into one room and it's almost a bit like an exam situation. I know it'd be, it'd be different now. I'm not sure how they will, how it will work in terms of, maybe you know this better actually in terms of how they send you the information for critical appraisal. But I had the, the, the abstract sent given to me. I had 10 minutes to read that and sort of process, you know, the information. Then we were, we were taken away from that paper. So I didn't have that paper anymore. Um, taken to another room and then they had the fresh print of the um, abstract and then they asked the questions and the questions they asked me were things like, so the first one was about, um, I had to give a brief summary of the findings of the paper. Um, and then we talked through the sort of level of evidence in terms of, uh, well, I guess that's an opportunity for you to critique the paper and um, the strength of the, the outcome measures that they had um, then there were questions about the trial design um, I mean it was a little while it was about know, two years ago so I can't remember specifically the question um, but they were looking at the trial and the format that they chose and then the method that they chosen for that trial um, and I guess at that point the they're not just looking for you to say exactly what it was, but perhaps um, why they might have chosen that or the benefits of them choosing that. So you know, you, there's always an opportunity for you to, sh within the time limit, to give a little bit more, look a little bit more into why they're asking that question. Um, then looking at this, the feedback that they gave me, they were, then they asked me a few questions about diagrams that were in the um abstract which was the bit that i struggled with um because they they were asking what what it so it was a picture of the diagram and they asked me what is the name of that diagram as in what style it was and i didn't know what the answer was for that and and i just said I, i'm sorry but I, i'm not sure what the, the name of that that specific diagram is in terms of style um and then they tried to ask, they asked me a few more questions um about the the diagram which I think I gave like a half answer really but it was I didn't know it and I think it's better if you sometimes it's better if you say I'm not sure rather than sort of try and blag your way through it um but those were the questions that I have for critical appraisal um a little bit of stats and a little bit of you know you need to know your knowledge of research uh, I mean trial types and and the benefits and cons of of different um methodology 
uh, and then we're obviously just trying to sort of route around and and establish how much you how much knowledge you have of the different um, trial types. Yeah, and, uh, yes, that's very that's very interesting. Um, so I had similar things as well. Um, so in the, if it's conducted virtually, they'll uh, so they'll send the um, document to you uh, in a chat, and and you have about ten minutes to look at it. Uh, and then when I was doing it, I'll have the the Zoom or Microsoft on one half of the screen and an abstract on the other half of the screen. So I can constantly refer back to it. And uh, things that they would ask, again, uh, they, they, I don't know whether this is true for other dinneries, but I certainly get asked about uh, several definitions of, uh, of things like what, what, what is relative risk, what is odd ratio. Uh, and, and I think most of the time, what I've heard from other AFPs as, uh, as doctors as well, is that the, the type of study that they tend to choose are random, randomized controlled trials or observational studies. Because these are the type of studies where there are sort of more discussion points in, some, in terms of different types of bias, uh, what is a double blind trial, what's a single blind trial, uh, what's error, what's, what's validity, and what's um, sort of, uh, what's the difference between, uh, oh, I can't remember now. Um, yeah, but um, anyway, yeah. And, and they, would, they would, yes, talk about uh, the types of study, the level of evidence, and, and, and one question that I think they quite like to ask as well is, um, how, how do you think this can be sort of translated into clinical practice or, or they will ask, oh, do you think this would be relevant? Uh, and do you think this would change your clinical practice or something like that? So they, they, they will also want to look at how sort of in terms of uh, how you would sort of translate the sort of research into, into sort of whether it would help change clinical practice. That's one, of, uh, one, one question that they sometimes have to ask as well. Um, yeah, so definitions of things, uh, different types of studies, um, I think probably read up a little bit on those before you go for the interview. So, so the second type of stations uh, that, are, that are very common is the clinical scenario stations. So, so Dr. Chen, so how, how was that for you, the clinical scenario? So um, I didn't have a session on a a scenario um, for the clinical scenario element. I just had the uh, critical appraisal and the personal interview questions. Uh, my flatmate at the time had a clinical scenario question. And from what she told me, it sounded very much, um, when I was preparing for interview, I was worried that, that that was the interview station that I was most worried about because, um, well, it just could be anything I felt like, but from what she said, it sounded like it was very much, they just want, they want to know that you're safe, firstly. Um, and secondly, it was not, it wasn't like an OSCE. It was more like a, I, I'm giving you the scenario, give me your thought process on what happens um, and what you would do sort of step by step. Obviously, I, I didn't actually have the scenario myself. So I don't know, did you have the scenario um, for your interview? Yeah, I did. Um, so it it's almost uh, almost like a discussion, like a, like like when uh, I don't know whether uh, you've had this before. It's like a, almost like a case based discussion where they present to you a scenario. For example, uh, you're the medical F one. Uh, you've been asked to see a patient who is uh, scoring on a news two uh, chart. Well, this this and this. Uh, this is the patient's background. What would you do? And and I think the most important thing you you want to you you want to show the the sort of interviewers is that you for any situations that is sort of that for example you, you've been asked to see a patient uh, in ED or you've been sort of called to to see a scenario to see a and you you always go want to go by the ABCDE approach 
So the airway, breathing, circulation, disability, exposure, which I'm sure you're all very familiar with. Um, and that's, that's, the, that's the approach you want to go for. And, and once you're going, when you're going through that uh, scenario, you can ask the interviewer for, for information. For example, you can ask them, oh, I would like to know what's the respiratory patient future rate is, or I would like to, and, and you can say things like, oh, I would like to take some bloods, or I would like to put a candle at this, uh, at this moment in time. And things like that, uh, and then and then towards towards the end of your A B C D E, maybe they'll ask you questions about A B C D E, or they'll ask follow up questions about oh, what investigations would you do, what what's your what's your differential diagnosis, and then and then they'll work through it. Uh, in the in the East of England interview, they also gave me um, uh, investigations result to interpret, so they gave me uh, they they showed on the screen. Uh, some blood test results, and they asked me to say, "Okay, so you thought about those differentials now. What what is your differential diagnosis now? Is does this change your differential diagnosis list? Does this confirm something or exclude something?" So, I think the the most uh, important part is you go through the A B C D E approach systematically, uh, and uh, and and I'm sure you you all be fine with that clinical mm -hmm. scenario station. I think the thing to remember is that they're not going to ask you something that is completely out of the blue. No, yes. um, in the end, you're you're interviewing for a foundation post and in foundation, you are not expected to know everything. So um, I think when we were prepping for interviews, particularly with my friend, because she knew she had the clinical scenario um, with the uh oxford handbook she went through in the you know that towards the back they've got that emergency section yeah um which gives a good i mean brief summary of things to consider you know the management plan working through a to e and then sort of the steps beyond that she went through that sort of made herself familiar you know familiarized herself with all of that um and and then that's sort of the the prep that she did for that section um but ultimately you know you've just got to show that you know when to get senior assistance and um to give a space a, a safe management you know don't you don't need to do anything drastic no yeah. um yeah <laughs> you know um yeah yeah it, it, it will be something that you would have all seen uh, definitely uh, I've, I've never heard of uh, someone going to interview and get get a scenario where it's really bizarre and really rare diagnosis. Yeah, they're, they're not looking for those. They're just, yeah, as Dr. Chin said, they just want to make sure that you are safe, you're a safe doctor, that they can supervise you in that uh, situation. So how to prepare for an interview? Um, do, do you want to, to come in on that, Dr. Chin? Um, yeah, so interview prep wise, I know that some of you are still waiting to hear from the different deaneries about um, interviews and whether you, you've been invited for an interview, but I would encourage you to start prepping as soon, you know, you can't prep too early, I'd say. Um, what I did for my interview prep was I had... So I've got a few books out at the library because I know that I needed for my critical appraisal to do a little bit more um, reading and revision and then perhaps some of the other elements of the interview. So I got a couple of, I went to the library, just had a quick browse, um, looked for a, a book that had a good summary of research methods, um, different, you know, a, a brief, a, it covers the statistical analysis side of things that I could just skim at um and just remind myself because I know that I, I did a BSc but that was between second and third year so it was quite early on um and I just needed to recap that side so for the for the critical appraisal I, I I'd recommend if you're not if you don't feel confident have a look at whatever resource suits you be that books or YouTube videos or going over your revision notes um if anything just to make yourself feel a bit more comfortable with the different um sort of technical terms and the questions that might arise 
Um, and then I'd say practice, practice, practice. So um, I was fortunate at the time that I had friends and I had a partner at the time who would um, do interview practice with me most nights. So um, it sounds like a lot of work, but I'd probably do just a couple questions um, most, um, most days, to be honest, in the work up to the interview. Um, so I'd maybe work through a couple of the interview questions that sort of generic interview questions that you'd expect that are sort of the, why do you want to do AFP? You know, what things will you gain from this? And then um, we did a few of the critical appraisal questions in which they would pick just, a, they just look on the internet for any kind of research article send it over to me I'd have a look at it for the 10 minutes as if I was practicing for the real thing look at it for 10 minutes look at the abstract um and then go through some questions well firstly every time I would describe to them what the paper was about so that was good practice to summarize what I'd read um and then we'd go through a few quest practice questions about um, sort of statistical analysis, what did this result mean? How is what implication does this have on, on clinical practice? Um, how can this translate to real life um, and clinical scenarios? Um, and I, I, I think that practice was hugely beneficial because you need to be able to firstly know how to deal with a question that you haven't prepared for and be able to quickly think in that period, okay, they've asked me this question, what exactly are they looking for? And how can I use this question to sort of showcase the, the experience that I've had? And only by practice can you um, do that in a, in a sort of fluent way that doesn't seem stuttery. And I, and I definitely found that as I went on and as I practiced this sort of day by day, it became a bit more natural. So I had a sort of mock interview early on with, I think it, there, was, there were a couple of AFP doctors in, at my uni who ran some mock interviews. I did one, I did a session with them and I mean, it went okay, but I was a bit, I, I, I didn't really enjoy the process and I hadn't really practiced for it. And I thought, you know, we'll just see how it goes. Um, didn't go brilliantly, went fine, but there were, see, there were things to improve on. Then started doing nightly or evening, in the evening, you know, worked through a couple of questions. Um, and then by the time I went to do the next mock interview, it was, it was much more natural and fluent. And, and I, I knew, okay, so um, I'm trying to think of the question in particular. Um, so I think there are a couple of questions of, you know, what challenges are there for it, of doing AFP? And then I would answer in a way that, that answers that question, but also brings back some points from my, from my previous experience. So I'd say, oh, um, I think some of the challenges would be balancing clinical and research time and making sure that I get all my competencies signed off for foundation for the clinical side but I've had some experience of that by doing um, my student selective component during university and I had and because the project extended beyond the sort of um, allocated period I had to balance that with completing my um, core procedures for fourth year so I had some experience of balancing both the research time and the clinical time um, so you, you, you sort of find a way of introducing the experience that you've had in a way that will also answer their questions so, do you know what I mean you get you get to show off what you've done alongside answering those the questions and it's only by actually practicing it that you um that you become more comfortable with introducing those subjects without it sounding like, oh, oh, I know, I just want to mention that I did this, and by the way, I did this. Um, it all becomes part of the conversation. Um, so I just say practice, I practice, practice, practice. Um, and there are a few, sometimes what I, I so I got, a, I got a, um, a sort of notebook and I wrote down 
different questions that I thought might come up either through the mock interviews or um, sort of the interview practice books that I've got. And I just briefly bullet, point, bullet pointed just in one sentence what I might mention and then an example that I had. So just two bullet points, you know, the answer to the question and then my example from my, you know, the experience that I had. Just two lines. So it didn't, doesn't take too long. And then you can slowly work through all of the questions that might come up. And then you've got something to refer to and you can quickly look through that and think, oh, okay, that question, I can mention this and I can mention this. So I th that, that was how I prepared for the internet. I found it really useful. Yeah, I, I, cannot, I cannot agree more. Practice is so, so, so important. Uh, and you don't want to go into the interview uh, being, um, being there and sort of have to, it's your first time answering those questions. Otherwise, you you'll be thinking, oh, what should, you'll be thinking as well as speaking, which is doesn't look good. Um, uh, but but don't but don't overdo it. As in, like, don't write a paragraph out and just memorize the paragraph for each question, because that would make you look um, sound sound like you 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 made a lot of preparation, and that 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 definitely not looking for those. Um, like Dr. Jin said. Jot down a few bullet points that you want to talk about, uh, and and it's always nice to link back to what you have done yourself as well. So uh, say like you you, know, you you wanted to say that you're interested in research. So what have you done in research? You can talk about your experience in student selective component, or or things that you've done outside of the curriculum to to show show that you're interested. So you want to have some evidence with you that to back up your points. Um, so, so yeah, for the critical appraisal interview, really I recommend reading some, going through, maybe you had some lectures on statistics or uh, going to the library, get a book to, to sort of get a basic understanding at least of, of the different definitions of, of common things like p-values, uh, relative risk, um, uh, uh, things like uh, randomized control trial, how do they randomize it, uh, what are the different types of biases, uh, how, how will you look for them in, in, a, in, a, in a paper, and just go through abstracts with, uh, with your friends uh, in med school or, or staffs in med school if they are, if they are willing to, and, and it just helps just, just go through papers, go through abstracts uh, with, with different people helps you with that critical appraisal station so, so much. Uh, in terms of personal and academic interview, so you really want to sort of remember if you've written things in the white space questions, they sometimes come up as well. So know what you've written for those uh, and be, pre be prepared to back yourself up in terms of what you've done over the last couple of years in medical school or even before or, or after medical school. Um, and um, yeah, and 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 for the clinical scenario one, as Dr. Chin said, so just go through the, the the last chapter of the Oxford Handbook of Clinical Medicine. That that will be more than enough uh, for, for that station. Sorry, I'm pressing the wrong button. Um, no, no. I was I was just gonna say. Um, Definitely, I'd agree. Definitely, your risk of over prepare. I know it sounds, you know, it's easier said. At one point, we're saying prepare, and then the next moment, we're saying, oh, you might over prepare. But there is the, definitely the risk of sounding a bit like a robot. And um, when I was preparing, I was wary of over practicing to the point where. I'm asked a question and I think I know what they're asking, but actually I've not listened to the question and I'm actually answering a pre-prepared answer that actually isn't, isn't looking at what they've just asked. And there is your, I, when you start practicing, you'll start recognizing when you stop going into an answer and you start churning out something that you've said before. And then you're like, Oh wait, I don't even know this is what the question if this was what the question was so the the reason we were saying to just briefly have a think about examples and what the answer is 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 to sort of prevent you from then going into a pre-written 
much feel that you've just learned off by heart because in the end that you can tell I think when this is sort of um uh, just an answer that you've written down and you're reading it off um compared to I you know I'm responding to what you're actually saying this is a conversation um and the other point that I was going to say was um the book that I found really useful for interview practice was I've just got the name here so um, medical interviews third edition and it's got um, a picture of the thinking man on it who's like this um, so look that if you can get hold of that book it says it's for higher trainees but I think the principles that it describes in it are really useful and so it, it tells you how to structure a question uh, an answer so um, it sort of, you know, it goes through what we've already mentioned before. Is um, so my answer to the question, an example of the question, and then bringing it right back at the end to how is this applicable to what I'm applying for. So don't just answer the question. Answer the question. Bring in an example if you can to show off whatever you've done because I'm, I'm sure you've all done really great things. Show it off and then round it off by bringing it back to. Oh, but also this was a great experience for AFP because I learned this, this and this, and I'll be able to translate these skills to AFP, sorry, SFP now. Um, and this will make me a better clinician by blah, 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 blah. And the book is really good at breaking down each of the questions that you may get and giving you an example of um, how to answer that question. So if, if you have a chance, look up that book. So it's, I promise I'm not a promoter. I don't have any shares in this book, but it's called, oh, one second. It's called Medical Interviews, third edition. But the first author that I can see is Olive, Olivia Picard. So that, that was my, you know, really helpful book. And I just, I didn't read all of it, just sort of skimmed through. Um, but yeah, if you have a chance, have a look at that. If anything, just for how to structure your answers. Yeah, Dr. Chin brought up a really good point. It's always answer the question. And if you're not sure what they're asking, ask, ask the interviewer to repeat what the question is. Uh, because you really want to um, answer, answer the question. If, you, if you're think, talking about things that are not related to the question, it doesn't look really good. Um, just just a other, other couple, a couple of points. Um, it, it is at the end of the day in the interview. So, uh, dress something presentable, um, like you're going for an OSCE or something. Um, no matter whether it's a virtual or face-to-face, -face, I don't know which it will be this year, but always dress, uh, dress as like OSCE smart, as if you're going for an OSCE examination. Um, and um, yeah, um, be prepared. It, it is natural to, to be anxious and to worry about interview. Um, but yeah, you don't you don't really want to show that in the interview. That once you once you get through a couple of questions or once you get through the first couple of minutes, you'll be fine. Just be yourself, and 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 that's what they want to see as well. To to be yourself and 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 learn about the great things that you've done over the last couple of years. Um, so in terms of the logistics of interview. So as we as we mentioned, we're still not quite sure how it will be this year, whether it will be virtual or whether it will be face-to-face. -face. If it's virtual, it's most likely it'll be on Zoom or on Microsoft Teams. If, if it's face-to-face, -face, then it's usually you have to go to that specific deanery. They have a specific location. It could be a medical school, it could be a nearby hospital. Um, and, and they give you a specific time and date for that. In terms of invitation to interview, uh, they some some will do through Oreo system, and they will notify you on there. Some will send you a direct email, uh, and and for some deanery, you will have to book an interview slot. So look at your schedules, look where it is best. Uh, don't uh, so if if you can try to sort of manage it and uh, don't have anything sort of around that uh, that period. Or if you if you have got placements that you can arrange, uh, leave, uh, I'd suggest sort of leave that day completely off uh, if you can. Um, and, and, I, and I think um, after the interview, the, I think the first round of offers come out in around January time. 
so it will be January 2022, there will be, I think, three rounds of office. So, for example, um, thing, uh, some people may not accept an, an AF, SFP offer uh, after, in the first round. In that case, that will go to the second round and, and you, you, get a, you get an offer. So you always be notified uh, whether you will you have got an offer or not. Uh, but it, and and I think uh, and I'm not sure whether they're still doing this, but once you get an offer, you have to accept it within 14 hours. Otherwise, it will uh, sort of automatically default you back to the normal uh, foundation program and um, and sort of will default you to saying that you're rejecting that offer. So, so don't forget about that as well. <laughs> Anything else you want to add on that? Um, no, I've not really got anything else to add to that. Um, my, my interview process, I think, was quite different to what um, you will all be having now because of the fact that, you know, mine's all COVID, <laughs> so it's all face-to-face. -face. Um, I think if you any of you do have face-to-face -face now, I... Um, made sure I it's just all you know sort of logistical things I made sure I got there super early because trains are unreliable <laughs> got there really early um so we knew the route made sure I had enough data on my phone so that I could find where I was meant to be going to up from the train station all those sorts of things um and yeah you know dress dress appropriately um just you know like 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 you said, things that you'd wear to your OSCE, nothing, you know, it's all common sense stuff really. But um I think probably what you said is 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 um more applicable at this stage because of COVID and everything being online at the moment. And so no, I've not got anything else to add to that really. Okay. So um I think with um I've 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 collated this PowerPoint with uh, with a couple of other AFP doctors, and uh, we just have uh, very quick slides, uh, and then we'll open up to everyone to ask any questions. So um, I don't know whether you've heard about this before, but there's this uh, framework which uh, which you can use to answer certain questions. So CAM framework, as you can see, is the clinical epidemic management and personal. So this is more applicable to the personal interview. Uh, where they want you to ask about what you've done uh, in, in over the past couple of years in medical school, what you've done in terms of clinical, on the clinical side, on the academic side, on the management side, on the personal side. Uh, and uh, you want to have a little bit of everything in, in each section. Um, doesn't matter if you don't have, maybe don't have too much academic things, that they're not looking for uh, medical students who have 10 publications or thing. So uh, even if you don't have any publications, uh, if, you've, if you've done things like audits, QIs, if you've done you know, student selective components, uh, those, those will be sort of valid as well. Uh, but but what, it, what it helps is sort of helps to sort of show you as an all-rounded person, you can do a bit of everything. Uh, and that's, that's what they're mostly looking for. Uh, when you're talking about any particular experience, opportunity, you may have heard about this STAR approach, the situation, task, action, result, reflection. You want to go through what happened in the situation. Uh, task is about what was the key thing that you want to do, so get across, you want to achieve uh, that specific things, um, action, actions that you, that you made, for example, research, or if you've done teaching, or if you've, um, you've you've contributed something in, in, in clinic in your placements and then, and then the result uh, what what was the outcome of your actions what did you accomplish what did you learn and and reflection is also important there um, a lot of the time uh, being a reflective practitioner is what they're looking for as well so what did you learn from the whole situation what could you do differently in this situation or, or how, how would that change change your practice in the future, for example, how would you improve or, or change your, your skills or performance, things like that. Um, this is uh, sometimes uh, applicable if, if they're giving you a some sort of difficult scenario uh, in, in the clinical scenario situation where, for example, patients waiting to self-discharge, um, what, what would you do? 
um, or uh, fellow African colleague is not sharing the workload, what will you do? So similar to the sort of SJT type questions, and how how you want to approach this is um, is the spice framework. So seeking information, what's happening, uh, what's going on, how did it happen, why it happened those kinds of things. And you always want to keep patient safety in mind. So always prioritize patient safety. Uh, that's again, shows, shows them that you're a safe practitioner, safe doctor. Uh, initiative, what will you do initially? Um, for example, if it's a, um, a scenario where you've been asked to see a patient, always go for the ABCD approach uh, and escalate. When would you escalate this to, to your senior? So. Uh, as well as being a competent doctor, they also want you to recognize that there are certain limitations uh, in your knowledge uh, and in your competency. You, you're, you're just starting out as an F1. There will be things that you've not done before. There'll be things that um, other sen seniors will be more appropriate to, to deal with. So um, senior support is something that if you said, um, I would call five seniors, it shows that you know that there is senior support and you recognize your own limitations and don't work beyond your competency. And that again shows that you're a safe doctor. And, uh, and, and finally support, support from a senior, support from a fellow colleague, um, support from anyone. And always keep in mind the four pillars of medical ethics. So the beneficence, non-beneficence, justice and autonomy. So sometimes you'll get ethical scenarios as well. So those will become in handy. Um, as we talked about before, try to keep the answers to the point. If you don't understand what the question is referring to, always ask them to repeat again, back them up with your evidence, your opportunities, your experience. And then finally, like Dr. Shin said, how this would help you to become a successful SFP doctor. Um, so things like they, they, they like to ask about is time management, how, how you manage between clinical and academic work, uh, how would you cope under pressure. Uh, so so this, is, this does not only apply to SFP doctors, this is any FY doctors will, will, will have pressures uh, because the NHS is currently under a lot of pressure. And, uh, and there will be days where, where you'll be so busy that um, <laughs> that you would have no time to rest and have breaks. Uh, but, um, and um, yeah, practice with friends, practice, 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 previous applicants, or, or just by yourself, just by sort of going through a different uh, A2E, just talk through it yourself, talk to a mirror, record yourself, and, and you, you'll be amazed how much you, you can learn from those experiences. And okay, and you'll see, okay, I've missed this. Um, remember that I'll do it next time. Uh, so we've mentioned this before for the clinical scenario stations. You know, I, I think you'd all be very familiar with this book, the Oxford Handbook of Clinical Medicine. Uh, the the last chapter of this book is the emergency situations. So we'll go through the scenario for shortness of breath, chest pain, uh, abdominal pain, acute abdomen, nausea, vomiting, and anaphylaxis. How how you would sort of what clinical features are there? How would you initially manage them? and things like that. Uh, and again, just to stress again, it, it, they won't ask you very bizarre things. It will be something that you definitely would have seen on placements during your medical school years. Yeah, so always follow the ABCD approach. Um, you would all be, I'm sure you're all very good at this, but treat the problem as you encounter them. Um, there's a reason why is uh, arranged that way, A, B, C, D, E, rather than maybe C, D, E, B, A, or something like that. Um, and, uh, and, and try to return back to check if the intervention works. So for example, if you're doing a briefing assessment, initially you would ask uh, the examiner, oh, what is the respiratory rate? What is the oxygen saturation? So if they have low oxygen saturation, then you decided to give them oxygen 50 meters via non repeatable mask, for example. At the end of your briefing assessment, always ask, okay, so I want to recheck the oxygen saturation now. What is the respiratory rate now? And then know whether the intervention has worked or not. If not, act on it. If yes, then you're okay to move on to the next part of your management. Um, if you suspect a problem um, early on, you would still follow the A to E assessment. So, for example, mm -hmm. uh, if you if an airway, um, for example, if 
for example, breathing, you found that um, there's some uh, hyper resonant in, in one of the one of the chest side, one side of the chest wall. You're thinking, okay, maybe this could be pneumothorax, but um, but you all you want to sort of follow through to complete the, the whole A B C D E assessment very quickly. Um, you can say things like, okay, I suspect that this may be a pneumothorax. Uh, I've given mm -hmm. oxygen, I've taken the ABG or all the checks X-ray. I'll complete my A to E assessment to confirm that I'm not missing anything else. Um, they won't, they, they won't be that, they, they won't put a trick as in they, they, they won't be, I don't think there will be two clinical problems that they will ask you to treat. It's usually one scenario, one clinical problem, uh, but you never know. Mm -hmm. uh, so always, always go through A to E before. So yeah, prioritize, delegate, escalate. So as a, as a FY doctor, you, you want to be able to prioritize things. So I, I've heard of some, some interviewees uh, given maybe two or three scenarios at, at the start of the interview and, and asked and being asked which patients would you see first. Uh, and that's, that's, that's a fairly tricky question, actually. Um, things that um, you could go by is um, looking at the news tool score, which is a very useful tool. Um, you very quickly screen through your differential diagnosis list for each patient and, um, and sort of how, how urgent your management would be. Um, so just an example, a patient with uh, chest pain, uh, sweatiness, um, so okay, uh, and another patient who will maybe having um, uh, scoring scoring a two or something with low blood pressure. Um, yeah, so you would probably prioritize the chest pain patients first because you suspect ACS and that needs more urgent treatment than a, for example, post-op patient who, who commonly has hypotension. Uh, delegate, you can always ask for help, uh, ask the nurses to do things, ask for ask your other colleagues, um, uh, and uh, and escalate if, if the scenario uh, sort of requires you to. Uh, so going back to clinical appraisal stations, uh, key points to address. So things when you're summarizing a paper, um, you, sometimes people will talk to you about this PICO framework. Uh, so population intervention control outcomes. This is more sort of applicable to randomized controlled trial. So what's the population is what what people did they recruit? Is it children that they're looking at? Is it adults that they're looking at? Is it COPD patients? Is it patients with MI or is it patients with high, high, blood, pain, high blood pressure? What is the intervention? Is it a new treatment versus old treatment or is it a treatment versus a placebo? Uh, and then control, how, what is the control control group compared to the, sort of the treatment group and what is the outcome? So that's one framework that you can use to sort of help you summarize um, randomized controlled trials. Uh, validity, you, you, can, you can read about this, but more in your own time. So there are two types of validity, internal and external. Uh, and um, uh, we won't go through that uh, too much. Uh, I know I'm a bit aware of the time at the moment, uh, but yeah, validity is something that you can ask as well. So medical ethics we've, we've mentioned before. Uh, know about the uh, prism of um, level of evidence. So the systematic review meta-analysis has the greatest amount, greatest power or the, the, the gold standard research things that, that has greater power and influence uh, compared to, for example, randomized control trial or cohort study, case control study, case series. So no, no which one of them are. And, um, and yeah, and know about this as well. Know, know a little bit about pros and cons of each of different ones, common biases of each. Um, yeah, so read about them because they can, they can come on into you as well. Uh, yeah, as I talked before, some, some, some interviewers will ask you about uh, definitions, so common terms of p-value, confidence interval, relative risk, types of bias, errors, outcome, and things like that. So all of these, yeah, you want to prepare for. Um, so these are some some books that uh, a couple of AFPs, SFPs have uh, suggested. So first one is the Oxford Handbook of Clinical Medicine, we've mentioned medical interviews. I think this is the one that Abitin suggests. 
Is this this the one? <laughs> yeah. That's the one. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Uh, how to read the paper? That's more for the statistics part, uh, more critical appraisal of medical statistics at glance. So at a glance, um, so series, that's quite useful as well. Check out your dinner's web page and person specification, uh, but they can be quite general at some point. And attend general clubs if you if you if you can. So those those can help you help to improve your critical appraisal skills too. So yeah, um, I, I know that we're coming up to eight o'clock now. So thank you so much for staying with us until this time. I know this is a Saturday evening, <laughs> and you've all given up your time to come to come to, to this session. So uh, we're happy if you if, if if you if you if you need to leave or something, feel free to feel free to leave. Or we'll be here for a couple of minutes for any questions. And thank you, Dr. Chen, again for coming. No worries. Thank you for inviting me. Um, I'll just say, if you've got any questions about your interview process or what's involved and you can't find it online at the Dean Rue website, send them an email. Just ask. Um, I mean, they, they can't, they can't, you know, the worst I say is I don't know. So just ask yeah. them. Yeah. Right. Anyone got any questions? While you're there, uh... While you're over there, I'll just copy a link of the feedback form into the chat. Uh, it'll be really helpful to get your feedback as well. Uh, we'll stop the recording for now.